here we, we are on the Irish Repertory Theatre's Meet the Makers. We have Paul Muldoon, Jean Hanf Korolitz, we have Nina Matza, and we have Liz Newmark. On this, you were joined, the production team was joined by two exceptional human beings. Would you like to mention who they are? Yeah, it was just a wonderful experience, and we were so fortunate that we had Kathleen Begala and Laura Eustace as our executive producers. We got together uh, to, to do a production of James Joyce's The Dead, mm -hmm. and we all got into a room, and it became the most glorious symbiotic relationship between art of putting a theatre piece together, bringing in some of the most gorgeous catering and food that became a part of this immersive experience. Dot Dot Productions, Nina and Jean, brought this idea to us at the Irish Repertory Theatre. Paul and Jean had done an adaptation of the James Joyce's The Dead, and we all just started to have an enormous amount of fun. So I'm going to start with just asking Paul and Jean, how did you approach making this adaptation of this iconic story by Mr. Joyce? Our goal was to never be in the same room when we were collaborating. That was, that was the first great idea. But I, I did a first run at it. I, I had a more, um, I had more of a kind of a macro overview of how the thing could be done. What I didn't have was a deep knowledge of the text and the story, but luckily Paul did. So there was a lot of passing the script back and forth between us rather than laboring together over every sentence. Funnily enough, <clears throat> I became interested in adapting the dead a long time ago in the mid, actually early 1980s. I tried to write an opera based on the dead. And in fact, I'm still hoping to do that one of these days. So it's a story that, um, I felt very close to for a long time. However, however close I feel to it, <laughs> I always feel that it's eluding me slightly. It's slightly beyond me. It is uh, one of those stories, uh, perhaps not one of them, perhaps it's the one story in English literature that is um, so complex, so boundless, so profound that it really is something that, however close one may feel to it, one is never quite, it's never quite uh, as close as one would hope. Would one of you like to um, sort of give a brief synopsis of what the actual story of the well, dead is? You know, the, the broad stroke is not exactly what this story is about. Basically, it's set on the Feast of the Epiphany in uh, 1904. And there's a party in this very interesting milieu in Dublin, the milieu of light opera, kind of music, musical societies. Everybody's interested in tenors and, and uh, choirs. And these, these particular sisters run the party each year. And this particular year, the main character, I suppose one would say in the story, Gabriel Conroy, makes a discovery of his own. He has his own epiphany about uh, his life and his relationship with his wife, Greta. In the midst of all this uh, toing and froing and frolicking and uh, merrymaking, uh, there's this intense sadness and, and maybe even desolation and it's with that image that that the uh, the story ends <laughs> the solid world itself which these dead had one time reared and lived in is dissolving and dwindling I know that on your work on it, you tried to bring the famine into the room, which was uh, something that's in every in Irish consciousness. Even today, I mean, I have been talking to people around Ireland in recent times about the famine and the extent to which it was <coughs> discussed. It was not discussed for the most part. It's kind of national trauma, which is uh, rolled under the carpet. We invite them to a famine and then we give them a feast. It was a fascinating um, layer to put in. What people most certainly did get was the furthest thing from the famine. They got the most luscious, gorgeous food. Liz, because you, your company is called Great Performances, because you founded this company to help out what I understand is a, 
women for trying to pursue their, their arts. That was the basis of it. But then you've built the most iconic company in New York. Would you tell us a little bit about the, the beginnings of the company? Jean and I crossed paths years ago. And I think seeds were planted that grew in so many different ways. So GP, our, our seeds, our origins are in the arts. We started as a waitress service just for women. And very early on, we realized that uh, it's nice to have a few guys around. So we we brought in men and we started doing food because our clients would ask us for, for more than just the service. And this is um, coincidentally our 40th year, our anniversary, from feeding most privileged New Yorkers for 40 years. We fill our days now with preparing meals for housebound elderly New Yorkers who can't go to their senior centers anymore. But you so, know, Liz has always done outreach through her through her business. This is what we first met over. I was writing an article about the Sylvia Center, um, which works with kids in New York City to sort of basically take them up to her farm and show them how to cook. Nina, I want to talk to you about how you came into the process. I know that you and Jean sat down and, and talked about this long before uh, we knew anything about it. Tell us about that. Jean came to me and said, I have this crazy idea. I want to do this immersive production of The Dead and I want you to produce it with me. And I said, that's a crazy idea and I'm not a producer and no. And I think I was scared and I didn't know what I was doing. She really said, I don't want to do this alone and I think we can do something really beautiful together. And that sounded really beautiful to me. So that was kind of the genesis of it. You guys told us no in the beginning. We had just reopened the, our theater at the time right, and as right. a not-for-profit we were worried about you know expanding beyond our walls at the time and yeah. you actually took the risk and you took the risk away from Irish rap at that time and you guys didn't know it was going to work out either. Well, that's where guys. the good marketing comes in. We didn't have a budget to run ad, ads in the New York Times or run a radio you know spot or anything like that so what we had was yes in some ways this is a hot ticket because you have to pay a lot of money to get it and we can only seat 40 people at this amazing dinner that great performances is going to cook for you and recreate the feast from the dead a night and we know new yorkers and who's not going to want that and i will say that the one other thing we did which was very much to matt ross's credit the pr guy he had the idea that we should put two tickets up for lottery every night at the price of 19 dollars and four cents so that we were offering the opportunity to young people and to artists who would not be able to pay the high ticket price. We all learned as we went because you certainly knew how to put on a magnificent show, but you'd never done an immersive show before. And Liz, who is a master at what she does, I don't think had ever done anything quite like this before. And I think in a way, that's a big part of what made it so successful is that we were all learning from each other and really respecting that with each other and supporting each other through the whole process. I mean, it was immersive on so many levels. Everything that people ate or drank at the dead was in the text, it was part of that world. And because people knew when they climbed up those stairs into that parlor, they were the guests of the Mrs. Morkins and it was 1904 and this is what you eat. You know, you think about the environment that it was in. Often you're transported and you feel like you are somewhere else but you were really there. It became such a communal experience. Here were all of these strangers having the same experience at the same time, and they were able to turn to their right and turn to their left, and they were introducing themselves to each other and talking about the experience that they were having. At the table, they were literally breaking bread together. <laughs> So, Paul, the New York Times has called you one of the most important poets of the last 100 years. And I'd also know that you're, additionally to that, you're a playwright. Jean, you're a novelist, and here we have a play. I guess it's a novelette that you're going to adapt. So, how did that work? I definitely took the coward's way out by sticking as close to the text as I could. The biggest change that even I could see had to be made was... Um, 
although it's worth saying that, that, that Paul wants to revisit this change one day, is that in our uh, version of the story, Gabriel and Greta do not leave the house of the Morgans to get in a handsome cab and go across Dublin and go to the Gresham, uh, the Gresham Hotel, Hotel and climb the stairs and find themselves in their hotel room. I said that is not going to work. We have to come up with a reason for them to spend the night on Usher's Island. So that, that was the only big change that I made. Yes, I mean, a lot of the text of the story is dialogue. And even uh, <clears throat> when it's not evidently so, i.e. when there aren't quotation marks around it, it is actually dialogue. No one is going to be doing any better in, in the writing business than James Joyce. So I think we were very wise to stick with as far as possible with what Joyce had written. I want to get back to Liz and the food. We had our very first read through of it. I guess it was a little small tryout and it had Kate Burton and Mr. Slattery. John Slattery was at that time, he was our Gabriel. Liz, I remember you coming in that night. It was the first time that I met you and you come in and, 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 you, and you gave us a, a talk on the food that was just so fabulous. I remember this whole notion of balancing authenticity and realism. What was in the book and talking about goose, I think we went from the goose to really trying three different kinds of meats. And before we finally settled on doing the turkey, we worked on the glaze. I think we ended up with a fig glaze, right? Mm -hmm. And also to balance practicality, how to get a meal served, how to get it served hot, how to really watch our budget, and the flowery uh, potatoes. <laughs> so we tried to figure out what flowery potatoes were. And I think, again, we, we did the research and we tried to figure it out. And finally, we realized if you boil them for so long and then they burst, <laughs> and that was a flowery potato. And than just figuring out, you know, probably no one had greens in the middle of the winter. That was a concession that we made to the taste of the modern uh, theater goer, that we, we, needed, we needed a green vegetable. You know, uh, Garen will remember this since he and I were brought up, both brought up in Ireland, but my father, for example, swore by the ball of flour, as he called it, a beautiful flowery potato. And actually it had to do partly with the uh, brand of the, the type of potato it was. That's the kind of detail that I think we were very happy to let go. There was not one customer who came or one patron who came to see the show that says, I cannot believe you are not serving exactly what Joyce wrote. I don't think not no, one. No. Not one. It was no. delicious. The food was gorgeous. The food was so good. They raved about the food. Raved and, about you know, you'd think the they'd food. be tired of it. They were looking at the same dinner every single night for however many performances, at the end of every performance when the audience had gone home and they had changed out of their clothes, everybody went to the kitchen to get leftovers. We had so much pride in it. It just really spoke to who we were and yeah. where we really wanted to be. You know, we could do a thousand parties a year and not one really weaves in what our roots were, where our hearts are, the attention to detail, the art, and the celebration of the waiters. They did not feel like service people. They, no, they, they just felt like part of this production. Uh, hey, remember the night we had Megan Kelly and Justice Roberts? That was a cool night. That I was such remember. a cool night. We should talk about some of the, the cool people who, who came and seen this show. Well, I was actually gonna say that one of the, just from a producerial point of view, that one of the ways that was also very unusual that we financed the show was that we held these private evenings where people could buy out the house of 42 people and what they got for that in addition to owning the show for the night so they could have a private experience was that they would get a you know drinks with the cast afterwards but also a talk back from Paul that was quite a masterful lesson in Mr. Joy so that's just a preface to yes yeah, some of the amazing Yes, we have. Yeah, I have to tell my favorite uh, Justice Roberts story was that un unfortunately on that night it was one of the most frigid nights in New York. You know, it was also part of the atmosphere that we tried to create. Right. We had cracks in the window. That, that's <laughs> It was very, it's very Usher Island. Just as Robert's wife was freezing cold and he, he's a very chivalrous man, he got up, he went down to the cloakroom 
to retrieve his coat to put around his wife's shoulders, but there was nobody in the cloakroom. So he decided to go in and retrieve his own coat. And then the house manager returned and saw him and said, Sir, how dare you? This is not, you are not allowed to enter the cloakroom. So the man of the cloak uh, had to apologize uh, and he was and he went upstairs sheepishly and put the uh, his cloak around. I never uh, heard that story. And what about Stephen Colbert? Stephen Colbert and Keegan Michael Key were there the same night and they were they later recreated their response to it on the Stephen on the Colbert show and uh, it was very funny. They were talking about how they were both crying and their wives were elbowing them like, you're in public, stop crying. All my life I've been completely, utterly in love with Michelle Pfeiffer and she came. Yeah, so we're glad we could arrange that for you. It was just so uniquely um, intimate yeah. and every component of the production from, from this incredible piece of literature to the, to the actors, uh, to the fact that there was you know, this delicious meal. I mean, it was just a night of revelations, just one after another. And I think the night I was there, it really did snow. It was magical. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Kira. What a privilege and pleasure to have you guys all on the same, uh, on the same Great. Zoom. Thank the same you for room. the privilege of inviting thank us into so this uh, production. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Be thank well. you so much, guys. Take, right, care. take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.